When American hospitals were built, they were built by their communities to serve their communities. It's an incredible heritage. Many of them were built by the wealthy business leaders as a donation or a charity. Many were built by churches. They were built by everyday members of the community to serve that community. Their charters were incredible. Mr. Hopkins dedicated Johns Hopkins to serve, quote unquote, the indigent of the city, regardless of one's race, creed, or ability to pay. This is our great public trust. Hospitals were built on a great public trust. When polio affected 20,000 people in the United States, disabling people, putting them in an iron lung machine, one of the worst things you could possibly imagine, Jonas Salk invented the vaccine. He was told by many of his colleagues and business friends, you should get a patent. This will be the greatest money-making patent in the history of patents. And he said, no, this will be a gift to the American people, the property of humanity. We talk about drug pricing today. Look at our great heritage of the public trust. All of us that see patients at every level, doctors, nurses, physical therapists, when you see a patient, we have inherited this great public trust that allows us to have an intimate relationship, one of the most beautiful things in our profession, and we have that bequeathed to us from our predecessors because for centuries, Health professionals have earned the public trust. According to one philosopher, who else is an advocate for equality than the witnesses of birth and death? That is our great medical heritage. When I see a patient, I need them to trust me. Sometimes we have to make tough decisions and we need to make them together. I rely on that public trust. In no other profession, can you put a knife to someone's skin within a second of meeting them? And they'll let you do it because of the public trust. They will tell you secrets they've never told anybody their entire life. They will tell you within seconds of meeting you because of that great public trust. But today, that great public trust is being threatened by a new business model in some areas of healthcare that is price gouging. Let's call a spade a spade and use the patient-centered term price gouging and even predatory billing. You know, I've got friends uh, in my department of surgery. We do a lot of cancer surgery and they've asked me, why don't you come to our cancer research ideas meeting anymore? You seem too busy to come. And I tell them I'd love to come, but you know, I'm working on this other stuff. And they, they'll ask me, why are you doing this other research on pricing in healthcare and the markups that patients encounter and payment reform? And what is this about you going to courts, court cases, defending patients pro bono who have been sued by hospitals to have their wages garnished? And I tell them, you know, 64% of the American people say they've avoided or delayed medical care for fear of the bill. We have a public trust crisis right now in healthcare. And we need to rebuild that public trust. Our cures for cancer, I told them, are no good for half of the public if they won't come in to see us. And right now, we have a public trust crisis. I do go to court. And I will serve and defend any patient pro bono who has been sued by a hospital for a bill that they cannot afford to pay, and we win 100% of the time. We are trying to create public accountability. We understand the codes. We know the games. We know that we have good people working in a bad system. Hospital leaders, people in insurance companies, they're not diabolical people. They are good people who have inherited a terrible, horrible game that has gone out of control. We've inherited a game of 
inflating prices for the purpose of offering secret discounts to different groups. It is a crazy game and it's spun out of control and somebody needs to stop and say, let's take a step back, this is completely crazy. It threatens the great public trust. You know, if airlines told you, we can't show you a price for the flight. You went on the travel website and there's no price. We have to bill you after the flight. We can't predict if there will be a delay or maybe a cancellation that would change the price or maybe the pilot will experience turbulence and have to work harder and bill and code more RVUs at the end of the flight and that would change the flight. We would say, that's crazy. This is a crazy game. How about an honest price? And you know what? They give us an honest price. If there were no prices on airline sites when you bought tickets and instead you got billed afterwards, guess what? You would get gouged and there would be gouging going on all over the industry. You'd be getting a surprise bill for drinking a beverage of, for $800 and it would threaten the great public trust in the aviation industry. Yet in healthcare, that's exactly what we have. Now we can get our house in order and give prices for common predictable services. These are achievable tasks. After all, our great academic medical centers are the center of scientific genius. I can tell you 500 facts about the Whipple operation, except for one, the price of it. <laughs> now, I do know the price of it, but as a part of our training, that's, we have been focused on taking care of patients and taking care of their medical health. We need to take care of their financial health as well. I had an executive from Google read my recent book, The Price We Pay, and wanted to have a conversation. And we had a talk, and he said, what can we do to help? I said, we need more public accountability. And if we can create the same measurement, benchmarking, and improvement that we have seen in other areas of medicine and other areas of society and other industries, we can do better. We can do better. I said, when somebody Googles the name of a hospital, instead of just putting, putting on the results, the name of the hospital, the address, and the phone number. How about putting the name of the hospital, the address, the phone number, the average price markup, the leapfrog quality score, and their billing quality metrics? How about some public accountability? My team at Johns Hopkins believes firmly that financial toxicity is a medical complication. Billing quality is medical quality. And taking care of a patient means taking care of the entire person. None of us took an oath to treat a patient, cure their disease, and ruin their life financially. It's not part of our great medical heritage. We've created billing quality measures. They are quality measures, but they are measuring billing and pricing quality. These measures published this month in the Journal of the American Medical Association are very simple. Number one, does the hospital or medical center provide an itemized bill in plain English? It doesn't make sense that these bills are uninterpretable by the hospitals that issue them. Number two, does the hospital offer a real price when patients ask for common shoppable services? Look, I'm a surgeon, if you get shot in the chest, we're not gonna give you a price. We're gonna take care of you, and we should. We should not be giving you a price. But you know what? Over 60% of medical care is shoppable and predictable. These are elective services that are scheduled. We can do better. We can give you a real price, not a crazy inflated price, designed for secret insurance discounts. Number three, do we give prompt service to those who call and have questions about their bill? If somebody has a concern about a mistake on their bill, we should have the courtesy of a prompt service where we engage in a civil dialogue with the patient, listen to their concern, investigate the concern, talk to the 
clinicians on the ground, figure out if there was a problem, and close the loop and call the patient back. That is civility. If you bought a car for $25,000 and you called the next day to the person who sold it to you and said, hey, there's something terribly wrong here, and they didn't return your call, you would feel that that public trust has been violated. Number four, does the hospital sue patients? Any hospital that does not provide prices does not have a right to sue patients. In a study we published in JAMA last summer, some hospitals, 20 to 30%, are suing patients. These are nonprofit hospitals. Some have argued that they have to sue to garnish the wages of patients in order to stay afloat. But we point out that all the money they collect from garnishing wages is less than half of the CEO pay. And if they're that concerned uh, that it's a business, how about pay taxes? They get millions of dollars in tax benefits for a reason. And that reason is they were built on a mission to serve their communities. Number five, do they have surprise bills at their institutions? Some hospitals have said there's no surprise billing here. We have direct contracting with the docs. And we have a system of employing doctors. And we have requirements of those who practice in our facility. And if somebody is Seeing you out of network at an, your in-network hospital, if we're in your network, we're going to disclose that before the elective care. That's honesty. That's honesty. And finally, our patients bill directly for medical complications that are the result of a never event, something that should never happen in healthcare. Okay, believe it or not, today in America, still some patients are charged for complications of never events. You leave a sponge in at the time of surgery, the repeat surgery to remove it is charged to the patient. That should never happen. These are basic issues of civility. So the next time somebody asks you, how do we fix healthcare? You remind them of our great medical heritage. And when we throw every stitch, we have to remember that great public trust. When we prescribe every medication, we have to remember that great public trust. When we have a business transaction in healthcare, the number one thing we should think about is that great public trust. It is our medical heritage. Thank you.